Hello, uh, welcome to our talk on CryptoLeaks. My name is Markus Kompa. I'm an enthusiast in history of espionage. In February, I learned of a secret collaboration between US and German intelligence to gather information from rigged crypto machines. For that, they owned and controlled a Swiss firm, Swiss corporation Crypto AG. The program was so important uh, that they decided this to hide this even uh, from the parliamentary control and for complete other reasons I got in contact with the journalist who unearthed uh, this secret and what he told me about his uh, way of research was so fascinating that I decided uh, you, I, I have to share it with you and here it is. Peter F. Müller is an old-school muckraker, he mostly works for TV he often covers stories related to organized crime and intelligence uh, affairs. Two decades ago, he shot a documentary on the German Foreign Intelligence Service BND, Bundesnachrichtendienst, and he and his uh, co-author Michael Müller used the material for a book which became the classic history book on the BND. And via stream, I welcome two gentlemen from the Netherlands, Mark Simmons and Paul Reuvers. Uh, they are from Eindhoven, and uh, in these times it's hard to cross the border, so we decided uh, this way. Paul and Mark are engineers, and they formed the probably largest collection of cipher devices uh, from the era when cryptography was uh, accomplished by hardware. They also set up the cryptomuseum.org, and um, uh, they wrote a... a a timeline on the operations we nickname CryptoLeaks. You can find this timeline in the in a link in the description of our talk, and you will find there also two documentaries, uh, two articles with multimedia stuff, one in English and one in German. The English one was uh, written by Greg Miller together with Peter and was placed at the Wall Street no at the Washington Post. And um, it was the first Washington Post article which uh, got three pages uh, as a front page article. Um, another partner was Swiss TV and uh, the journalists in charge, Fiona, Nicole and Aniela, were promoted to be the journalists of the year for that piece. And there was, hmm? and there was a, a, th a third partner in the Netherlands. What's the name, Hüb? Hüb Jaspers. Hüb okay. Uh, from uh, Netherlands, Danish Radio. Our talk will uh, last uh, an hour and uh, we have 20 additional minutes for Q&A. I guess most of you are familiar with our topic so we can focus on additional aspects. So uh, let's meet the man who unearthed the Minerva document, Peter F. Müller. How did you do it? Well, good evening, everybody. Um, first of all, let me say that I'm pleased to be on the stage of CCC tonight, and it's a great honor to talk about this story. Um, how do you do a story like that? Uh, it's, a, it's a good question, as I work normally as a freelance uh, independent journalist, and I'm not embedded in a big editing team like big magazines or newspapers. Um, you can, as easy as it is, tell it, it's a result of long-lasting investigative journalism. Uh, one of the principles I follow is uh, when you did a story like 20 years ago, a, a history of the BND, you get in contact with people, and over the years you stay in contact with people. And uh, eventually that pays, pays out one day, and it's... Um, as simple uh, as it is, uh, one day uh, you have this brown manila en envelope uh, somewhere in front of your door or in your uh, letterbox uh, containing the information you never dreamt to get in your hands on. So, and this happened uh, some time ago, and uh, the person uh, who provided me with the material 
uh, was somebody who was long time involved with the German intelligence service. And uh, it was a matter of heart for him to give away those papers uh, because he simply wanted the public one day to know what kind of operation those bad guys, uh, as they are always quoted in the press, do as well. All in all, it was about 250 pages we got our hands on. And uh, we had to start first, read this stuff, read it three times, four times, five times. And always when you read it again, you find new information because you're uh, tipping in, in, a, in a new environment. Um, uh, when I got this papers first in my hand, I had to decide where to go to. And uh, as I uh, worked closely together with colleagues from ZTF, uh, I chose ZTF to go to, to Elmer Tavison, and uh, he jumped on the story, and uh, so I had a team to work with, uh, the funding for the story, and uh, together, with, together with my partner, Uli Stoll from, um, from ZTF, uh, we started to develop the story and took some international partners and advisors into our group, Erich schmidt Ebom from Weilheim and Professor Richard Aldrich from England, David Ritt. So we started. Um, what do you do when you start a story like that? Um, you start to check out what you can check out. You start to check names. You start to, 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 to find people you might talk to, as it was a, a very, very sensitive story. Uh, this was the biggest hurdle at the beginning, because you don't just go to, uh, to the B&D in Berlin and say, can we discuss this topic? I would like to talk to you about it. So you just have to figure out who are the persons you can confront it with and who to go to. And after all, for me, uh, that was an interesting experience. We decided to go to some CIA veteran first. Um, I had interviewed him some time earlier on a B&D story, and suddenly I realized that his name pops up in that story. So I decided to go there again. Uh, he was, a, at the time, uh, in the 90s, a CIA station chief in Bonn. So I called him again and said, look, I forgot to ask some questions. Can I come again? And I took my cameraman. We flew to Austin in Texas. And I sat down with him in the cafeteria of the hotel. And the conversation lasted five minutes. He didn't tell me anything. He looked at me and said, looked at me and said look, this is such a secret story. Um, we, uh, I can't take, talk about it. I will take it to my grave. And he said, I'm sorry that you did all the way down here. We stood up and went out. And then he turned around and said to me, you can see on the reaction of a guy like me that you are on a bloody good story. Good luck with it. And that's it. I had a confirmation that the story was a real one. But I didn't get any interview and nothing out of it. So, uh, but that was the beginning. And then we, we, we went on from there. Um, the next contacts were people, of course, in Switzerland. Crypto AG is a uh, shareholders company in Zug in Switzerland. And um, of course, you find former employees, you, for, you find engineers, uh, and some of them were ready to talk. So that were our next persons. And so you go on and on and on, and you slowly fill gaps. You get stories, you get side stories out of it. And uh, that's what we did. And at the end, uh, shortly before we went public, uh, I picked up the phone and called the former minister of the chancery, Bernd Schmidbauer. Uh, his nickname at the time was 008, because he was very keen on intelligence uh, matters. And uh, I went to see him uh, in a lovely village in the Austrian mountains. And um, he just said, yes, it's true. I can't talk about it, but it, that's it. So um, that's, that's the background of it. What I would like to do now, give you a short, a short historical background on it. Uh, the, uh, normally, you see, we talked a lot in the last couple of years, it was 
Snowden we talked about, all the uh, wrongdoings or so-called wrongdoings of the NSA and so on. What uh, we didn't see and what was completely underestimated in all those years, which role smaller countries played in that field of encryption and of uh, um, espionage. And uh, in this world, both the Germans and the Swedish, and later on you will hear as well as the Swiss, played a very, very important role. And um, the uh, German impact into that one began already uh, right after Second World War, when all the guys who were active uh, during the, the, the uh, Nazi times, uh, working on encryption, uh, came back and started working on it for the, uh, for the new West German state. Uh, guys like Hüttenhain and Going, they were right in the middle of it, and as early as in 1951, um, uh, General Galen, the then head of the Galen organization, already contacted the Americans looking for joint operations together with the Americans in order to control that market. And maybe, um, if I may, this is, would be a good moment to get Paul and Mark into the game because uh, they know much more about the historical background of the kind of machines they used and what they think. So um, can, we, can we switch over to Mark and uh, Paul in Eindhoven? Would that be possible? Okay. Paul and Mark, can you hear us? Yes. Okay. Hello there. We cannot Good see evening. you, but uh, I hear you. Hello. Great to have you here. Okay. Um, we have in our studio here the machine with which it all began. Um, and that's a machine from World War II, or at least it's known from World War II. It's an Enigma machine. Now, I hope you can all see our video stream so we can give you a live I demonstration. I personally cannot see it. Uh, can the people see it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so we, we are blind. Yeah. That's marvelous. Go this on. is the machine used during World War II by the German army. Uh, in Enigma 1, as it is called, by the way, um, a machine with a keyboard, 26 lamps, um, a panel with plugs at the front, and a set of wheels, moving wheels or rotors, that rotate when you start typing. So for every letter you type in, one of these rotors makes a movement, as Mark will now demonstrate, and a light will come on. Now, I had a second camera here, and perhaps I can show you a little bit more of this uh, machine, close up. Here you can see that Mark, when Mark types, uh, the rightmost rotor will make a single step, and at each time he presses a key, and not another letter lights up. Now, this may not sound very special, but this was the first time that a machine was used in encryption that used the principle of complexity, sorry, uh, security by complexity. So not security by obscurity, as it was previously known, but security by complexity. This machine had so many settings, so many possible configurations, that it would take at least 20 years to try them all out. Um, so that's the machine that, that started all of it. That machine was broken during World War II. But there is another machine that we probably will be talking about today, and it's a much smaller one. It's called an M209, and that's a very, very small machine. It is not very secure, but secure enough for tactical messages during the war. And that machine was used by the American Army during World War II. That machine was made by a gentleman in Sweden by the name of Boris Hagelin, and we will hear much more about him today from, from Peter. This machine was not safe, as I said. It could be broken by the Germans within four hours. That's an estimate. Uh, but it was good enough for tactical messages that have lost their, um, their value after, after four hours. Now, if we quickly open this, this machine, and I will show it in close-up again. So you can see that it's very small. It has six moving rotors that are in place, and it has a big cage with fast moves. And whenever you set up a letter here, an input letter with a wheel, 
the whole thing moves and prints the output onto a piece of paper. So a very clever machine, small enough to, to fit in a large pocket. Um, I think the first version of these machines was designed for the French army and had to be small enough to fit in the pocket of a, of a uniform trousers. This machine is slightly bigger, but Hagel sold hundreds of thousands of these machines during World War II. So it made him a very, very, very rich man. Um, I think this is a good moment, Peter, to go back to you. Yes, thank you, Ma um, uh, Paul. Um, just a few short words about uh, the, the, the origin of all this operation. Boris Hagelin was a genius a developer of encrypting machines in the uh, 1930s and 40s. And uh, he found his counterpart in America in William Friedman, who quickly uh, realized that uh, if the United States wanted to be in that business, they had to come together with uh, Boris Hagelin. So over the years in the 50s and 60s, there were various contacts between the two. And in the 50s, Boris Hagelin moved from Sweden to uh, tax heaven and more secure Switzerland to, to build up his company. So, and they, they went from there. All the times, the Germans were already involved in the background and there was various attempts by the Germans to get into bed with Boris Hagelin. Uh, but it only uh, came true in 1970, funny enough, um, it was Horst Imke, the Secretary of uh, State from uh, Chancellor Willy Brandt, the first Social Democrat uh, Chancellor we had, who signed the contract. It was the first time in the West German history that the uh, Social Democrats controlled the Foreign Intelligence Service, BND, and they did it with great worth, and they, they, they went forward, and they signed this contract. Uh, they um, had a very secret operation in Liechtenstein covering up who is the true owner and they kept this secret for many, many, many years and uh, it only really came out in uh, now 2018-19 when we published this story how it really went all the time. Uh, so let's let's ask the question, what is important about that operation? I mean, we all know that uh, spying operations did exist for centuries, and the history is full of it. What was special about this operation? Well, um, we are talking about um, um, encrypting machines, which are used by governments uh, in order to communicate uh, with their embassies overseas, back and forth, to communicate uh, within the military. Uh, so it, it, it's a highly, it's not a personal espionage, it's a highly political espionage uh, operation. And one um, of, um, of our um, guys in the group, Professor Richard Aldrich, once called it the intelligence coup of the century, in terms from, from an intelligence point of view. Um, to, to, to show you how important that operation is, uh, I give you a, a very small example. Um, there were two uh, uh, times in history, uh, in, the, in the late 40s and in the early 80s, when the Soviet Union, Soviet Union, who was not part of the, uh, the system, they, they, the Eastern Bloc countries did not get those machines. But of course, the Americans were able to cracks the coats of the Soviet Union uh, using in the Warsaw Pact. And then those, at those two occasions in 19, uh, at the late 40s and the early 80s, from one day to another, uh, they changed the code system completely. So overnight, Russia, or the Soviet Union at the time, for the Americans and the Allies, was a black box. They couldn't, they couldn't listen to anything anymore. And in those periods, especially in the 80s, um, the Operation Rubicon was the sole source of information for the Americans and the Germans what was going on in Russia. Very simple, because every ambassador from every meeting, from every meeting with military personnel on a, on a cocktail party or whatever, they send home long reports about what is going on in the Soviet Union. And at those days, this was the sole information 
the Western countries could get that was via Operation Rubicon. So that is, I think that's a good example to, to, to demonstrate how, how important, how important the, this operation was. I mean, they, they sold machines to about 120, 130 states, a lot of uh, uh, third world countries, of course, but uh, Western allies as well. I mean, Portugal, Spain, Italy, uh, some of the NATO members uh, were customers. And uh, what is not mentioned in our paper, uh, they don't talk about international organizations, which is quite uh, interesting because after we published crypto, uh, the, the Operation Rubicon, we, of course, we continued our research, and by now we know and we have the proof that all those international organizations from the United Nations, UNESCO, the World Bank, or whatever, they all used those machines. So um, you, can, you can easily say that, uh, why, uh, that, that this was really a web of espionage system around all the important political players in the world. Um, it, it, I would like to give you a few more examples what the value of the story in the political day-to-day -day business was. Let me start with Argentina. Argentina was one of the biggest customers of uh, Crypto AG. And uh, the BND had a, uh, an agent or an, an informant very close to General Videla in, in, the, in the late 70s. Um, and uh, they sold hundreds of machines. And uh, the same person, uh, Alberto Pautasso, was the uh, sales representative of Crypto AG in Argentina. So you all remember, or most of you will remember, that we had the Falkland War, uh, or the uh, War of the Malvinas, how it is said in Argentina. Um, and the British sent their troops down there, and they were close to losing this war, because far distance from um, Britain and so on. So, and then, uh, I don't know if you remember this big incident called the sinking of the Belgrano, which was a big battleship from the Argentines. The, the Brits didn't have any clue where the ship is. They had no idea where to look for and where to, where to find it. So, um, and it was the Germans who got the information. They had a listening post in Husum at the, at the, uh, um, at the North Sea uh, called Object Castagnette. And so they were picking up the, the, the traffic from the Argentinians. Uh, they decoded it. They passed it on to their Dutch partners. The Dutch partners jumped into the plane, went to GCHQ in London, and gave them the information. And a few days later, the Belgrano was sunk because they had the exact coordinates. More than 320 people died in that, um, in that uh, 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 ship disaster. That, that was one of the things. The, the, the Germans and the Americans were fully aware of all the human rights atrocities being committed in Argentina. Uh, it is mentioned on various uh, uh, parts in the, in the, in the paper uh, that they knew from the beginning on how many thousand people uh, were dumped from planes into the Rio de la Plata, the, the enemies of the of the um, uh, uh, political junta, of the, the, the military junta. Uh, so they were all informed about it and did nothing against it. Another example is Operation Condor, the operation where uh, a couple of South American states uh, came together uh, to jointly chase and kill uh, enemies of the, 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 the military regimes. And Operation Condor had an own um, uh, uh, communication system called Condotel, and they used the CX-52, which, which Paul uh, uh, just demonstrated to you before. So everybody was informed what was going on there. The next, next thing is the Panama invasion. You probably might remember the Panama invasion with uh, Pineapple Face, what they called him, General Noriega, 
who had been a CIA asset for uh, a decade, uh, who was one of the biggest drug dealers in the van, and suddenly uh, the United States said, oh, we have to get rid of him. Um, now, uh, he fled, of course, and he got into hiding. Uh, and then the Americans found him because Noriega had gone to the uh, um, embassy or nunciatur of the Vatican. How did the Americans know that? Because the Vatican was using crypto AG machines in Rome, and so they found out that Noriega was in the embassy. What did they do? They transported huge boxes and played terrible loud music over a period of a couple of days till everybody came out of the embassy and said, stop that shit. So that's, that's one little example um, of it. And uh, another example is the Labelle bombing in Berlin. The Libyans used crypto AG machines. And uh, the, the uh, allies, the Germans, the Americans, uh, most likely knew that there was uh, something planned. They had three, uh, three um, um, possible scenarios where to, where to plant a bomb, and finally they bombed the uh, discotheque La Belle with uh, um, hundreds, and hundreds of heavily injured people, a few dead people. And uh, the then President Ronald Reagan used is this uh, even announcing that they had the information from intercepted traffic from the Libyan embassy. And they used this bombing, uh, this, this uh, attack on this discotheque, which was mostly seen by American uh, soldiers, uh, as an excuse to start the bombing of Benghazi and Tripoli in Libya. Okay, I mean, um, I, I would like to, to, to bring back Paul into into Paul and Mark into the game because there is one interesting story about the about the uh, what is called the Turkish the Turkish uh, affair the, the Turkish story. Um, Turkey, of course, was a big customer of crypto AG, and uh, there's one side is the military, the other side is the diplomatic service. And the, the Americans, the CIA, approached Siemens, who was involved in the construction of those, those machines, um, to sell rigged machines to the, uh, to the American, uh, to, to the Turkish um, diplomatic service. And Siemens and the BND said, oh, well, listen, this is a NATO partner. We can't do that. We, we don't want to. And they said, well, if you don't want to do it, then leave it. And they moved on to Philips which was also partner in this system. And Philips uh, happily agreed to rig the machines and to sell them to Turkey. And we are talking here about a very special machine, um, which is called uh, an Aeroflex, which was one of the big sellers, Paul, correct me if that is wrong, uh, of Crypto AG at the time and of Siemens, a, a tail typewriter. And maybe you can explain us a little bit what is, what is uh, this machine about and how that works. Yes. Um, the machine is right here on the table right now. It is basically a Siemens teletypewriter, a Siemens T1000. That's the model number. But if you look closely at the machine, you will see that at the bottom mm -hmm. there is a crypto module. And I will switch cameras to show you that. Um, one second. Here you see that right at the bottom there is a little layer here with a few keys key locks and the button there. Now, Mark will try to open this device by tilting it sideways. Right. It's a heavy machine, so he may need a little help from me. Um, basically, this, is, this machine was made by Siemens as a normal teletypewriter, and Philips in Eindhoven in the Netherlands made a little unit that is on to the bottom of it, and that unit contains the cryptographic equipment, uh, the crypto module it is called. Here you see it. So this part here is a normal teletypewriter, and here at the bottom is the crypto unit. Now that crypto unit consists of a lot of electronic components that you see, all marked with little labels that say confidential, but there's one little mysterious block here yellow one, 
uh, with the words confidential and NATO secret on it. That's the crypto module. And Philips made various variants of it. So they had a NATO version, they had a police version, and they had a, a foreign version. And as you can probably imagine, the foreign version was, of course, readable, breakable. Now, this machine was used by all NATO countries, including Turkey. And these machines were safe. But Turkey also wanted to use it for their embassies. And, of course, the CIA would not allow that. You can't use uh, a NATO machine for um, embassy traffic of country. So, we had to make a special variant of this machine. Okay. But the Turks knew that there was a machine that was breakable. So, they had to make a little module that fitted in the old one, in the place of the old one, that made the machine behave like a normal Aeroflex machine, but was in fact breakable. And that's exactly what they did. So, in the end, they sold these machines to to Turkey, and several thousands of them. Um, and Western intelligence was able to read all the Turkish messages. Now, of course, Germany wasn't. Germany was excluded from the list because they had refused to cooperate with the CIA. Now, try to imagine this. Um, the BND is a partner of the CIA in Operation Rubicon, but because they refused to make breakable machines for Turkey, they were excluded from the intelligence that was gathered from breaking this machine. Um, Philips didn't make, uh, make themselves the job very easy. They designed a special chip that was needed to break this machine. So it was not a simple back door that you could open with a master key. It was something for which you had to break several binary equations. Uh, and that was not a trivial task at the, at the time. So they they designed a special chip that was used to break this machine. Uh, and that machine was sold to Turkey. Now, over time, there have been other variants of this machine. Um, too long to go into depth with that, but there is also a Chinese version, and you can imagine why that was made. Uh, so there are several versions of this machine, and except for the uh, NATO version, all other machines are breakable. Back to you, Peter. All right. Can okay. we go back to you, Pete? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Paul and Mark. Um, uh, the Turkish, the Turkish uh, case is a very special one because um, you might ask yourself the question, um, where did all the communists at the time called communist countries were in that, that whole thing? Were they witting? Did they know what was going on? Well, we have spoken to some people, uh, of course, and we have interviewed them um, who worked for the former uh, East German Stasi. And he told some very interesting stories. Um, of course, the Eastern Bloc countries uh, were very closely monitoring the whole market of encrypting machines. We have reports like 20, 25 pages long listing every single company who somehow is involved in producing encryption material, you see, from Siemens to Philips to, to, to all kinds of other machines. And f funny enough, Crypto AG does not appear in that list. So we asked the, 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 the very important um, informant, how does this happen? And he had a very simple um, explanation for that. He said, uh, uh, Crypto AG was Chascardé from the KGB. So there was a clear rule in the, in the whole of the Warsaw Pact states that whatever uh, concerned crypto AG was only and solely for the KGB to, to, um, and to, to check out. So whatever they did, uh, stealing machines, finding, buying machines, uh, getting um, um, manuals, uh, working manuals of the machines, it was all delivered to, to Russia and they worked with it. And of course, they managed to crack some of the codes of the machines. So besides the fact that the Americans and the Germans and some other, um, uh, what we call in German, Trittbrettfahrer, um, some other nations were uh, participating in those information, uh, there was a, a good chunk of machines the Russians and uh, the, the other countries could read. 
and as a kind of a present for the East Germans, because of course speak, uh, speaking German in Switzerland, it was easy for them to 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 uh, work around. Uh, they were delivered the 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 algorithms from the Turkish machines, so um, they were able to follow up all the Turkish traffic, uh, and that is important uh, in one sense. Uh, Turkey is a member of NATO. And whatever is communicated from Brussels home to, um, to, to Ankara, uh, they were able to read. The East Germans were able to read. So, and if you have one NATO partner uh, you read the communications, you have most of the other ones as well because they share all the, the, the information from there. So um, that, that was a very interesting aspect of our research to find out that uh, of course, the enemy, so-called, was um, also in that game. Uh, and some, um, some um, uh, American veteran of this whole story w once told us, uh, look, it was like uh, a big uh, a kindergarten, big boys playing espionage. Everybody knew it, everybody was doing it, and nobody said a word. Um, what... <sighs> We talked about the cases. Um, you might ask yourself the question, why did they write down this story? That's another very interesting, interesting uh, um, story. Um, in the late 90s, after the uh, Cold War was over, and uh, all the old veterans from the espionage game, uh, the old man, old white man, uh, came together every once in a while to chat about the old good times. And there was one meeting uh, at the Teufelsberg in Berlin, which was a former listening post of the Americans during the, 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 the years of the Cold War, uh, listening into East Germany and to the Eastern countries. And they, they once had a meeting uh, old CIA veterans, NSA veterans, um, BND veterans, and KGB veterans, Stasi veterans. They all came together, had champagne, and were clapping themselves on the shoulders what kind of good guys they had been. And at that occasion, the Americans and the Germans kind of had the idea, why don't we write, out, why don't we put down on paper this incredible uh, story, this in incredible operation? And that's how it started. The Americans got the official approval from the CIA and the NSA uh, to write down the story. Then they went a couple of years later to the Germans, and the guys involved on the German side wrote their part of the story. Most of it, uh, it's, it's, it's the same story. In some aspects, they vary because they have other uh, uh, moments of... Uh, talking about each other, financial business, and so on. And uh, that's how this was written down. And the funny thing is, the papers are written in plain language, so they don't use the cover names of the people involved, they use the plain names. This is one of the reasons why we do not publish those papers, because uh, there is a, an importance to, to protect sources, to protect people. Our, our aim is not to destroy people. So that's, we were a, approached by the Swiss especially uh, that we would hinder all kind of investigation into that case by not publishing those papers. I can truly say you that we would never do that uh, because we would endanger people and that's what we don't want to do. Um, so... Um, where are we? All right. Um, as you may be aware, the Germans went out of that operation in 1993. So uh, when you read the German parts of the papers, the involved intelligence people were, uh, were flabbergasted. You see, it was a political decision made uh, in the chancellery to get out there are various reasons for that. First of all, maybe technology had changed, you see, and the old machines were not that important anymore. Uh, there were other means of gathering information, electronic means. 
think they were political means. Uh, some uh, person told us if at that time, after the fall of the wall, after um, the Germans were trying with the French to get a new Europe together after um, the, the Maastricht Protocol and all that, uh, they said if at this moment the um, operation would have become known that this good Germany would have been part of such an operation even against their own friends and allies, it could have been uh, the political end for Helmut Kohl. So that's why they decided to get out of it. And um, uh, you might say they, they, they were furious. The, the, the agents, the, they were furious about it because they said, and that's what they're writing down, how can you go from the Champions League into the third or fourth league and don't play any role anymore? That's only partly true. That's only partly true. Because um, first of all, um, those machines uh, don't stop working in 1993 just because the Germans get out of the operation. Um, of course, many countries use those machines for many, many years because not everybody can afford to buy new machines every year. We're talking about hundreds and thousands of millions of dollars to spend. Um, and um, we know from talks in Switzerland in 2019 that the then uh, follow, um, um, follow company of Crypto AG had still contracts with old customers for service for old machines and so on. So uh, that means that even the Germans being officially out, they still had the opportunity for many, many years to, to read the traffic of a lot of countries. Um, a second probably very important thing is uh, for whatever reason, in 1976, the Germans, together with the Dutch, the Danish, and the Swedish uh, intelligence service, later joined by French intelligence, formed a new kind of operation without the Americans, without the British. And they met in a, in a beer garden in Bavaria, and they said, look, we have to, we have to find a name for our operation. And they were holding their, their mugs of beer, and it was a beer called Maximato. So they said, this is the name of our new operation, Operation Maximato. And from there on, uh, those five countries were sharing uh, um, signal intelligence uh, um, in the back of the, of the Americans. We don't know if the Americans knew about it or they accepted it. That's possible. This story still runs today, and it was only... Uh, really brought to light by an, uh, a Dutch uh, scientist um, and uh, uh, the Dutch intelligence service was not very pleased when we published that story but that means as the Swedish by contract from the early days of Boris Haglin on were always part of the information they were getting all the information from this operation Rubicon from early on and even before 1970. The Swedish got everything and being partner with the Germans and the other uh, countries in Operation Maximato, the Germans even uh, ending the Operation Rubicon in 1993, were still getting all the information um, which, which uh, came on afterwards. Um, we know now that when the Germans sold their shares to the Americans um, uh, in 1993, the uh, uh, CIA became the, the, the uh, um, uh, sole owner of the company, and this ended only in 2018. So um, it's f probably fair to say, although the papers don't talk about it, that's the research we did afterwards, that uh, all the machines after 1993 were as well rigged and sold all over the world. Uh, we are still investigating what's happening now because the company was sold uh, by management buyout to, 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 to two entities. And uh, frankly, there is no reason not to believe or to believe that any, any of these operations ended in 2018. Let me talk in a few minutes about, uh, about money because this was a shareholders' company, and in, in the early years, they made a lot of 
a lot of um, money with those machines. Uh, they had profits of millions of dollars. So, so the Germans, um, being um, very strict and, and uh, law-abiding, um, they were taking care of the administration, uh, the, the business side of the, of the whole operation. And what did they do with the, with the, with the profits they got? Well, it's very simple. They got it in cash from a bank somewhere in Switzerland or in Liechtenstein. Um, and then at one time, they had like 15 million, I think, or 14 million uh, dollars in profit to share. Uh, they took their part and transported it to the Chancellery in Bonn. And the Germans used part of that money to finance the uh, uh, the the. the political democratization in Portugal at the time. He gave it to the, to, to the uh, Stiftungen of the parties, Adenauer Stiftung, Ebert Stiftung, and so on. The only thing we don't know is what happened to Seidel Stiftung, because it never was mentioned what the C CSU did with it. And they gave the money to the Social Democrats, to the Christian Democrats, in order to overthrow the, uh, the dictatorship of Salazar. What did the Americans do with it? They met in a, they met in a, in a uh, parking garage, uh, and they handed over a suitcase with cash money. So like in a, in a B or C rated um, espionage movie. And um, as we know from our um, talks, the Americans used part of that money to buy other crypto companies, uh, competitors to crypto AG, because they had the aim, we want to control the whole market. So they used the money for that one. Um, well, there is two things which are not mentioned in the paper, paperwork. The one is I talked earlier about the, uh, the uh, importance of international organizations, which is by now proven. We have the paperwork, we have the, uh, the list from the United Nations, we have lists from Swiss archives what kind of machinery they sold when uh, to, to, to those organizations. Um, and the second part is, which is completely underestimated, public, uh, possibly in the public as well, is the importance of the economic espionage. Uh, nowadays, it's probably much more important to know what your partners in a ne negotiation about a trade agreement, trade agreement think and do the Japanese, the Germans, the, the Canadians, uh, because the political stuff is known anyway. So uh, this is probably the biggest, the biggest part of it, and the papers don't talk about that at all. The banks use those machines. We have SWIFT, the International Finance Directorate, who use those machines. So there is a, a big, big area uh, where information gathered uh, is most important for, for governments. Now, let me, let me give you a final, a, a last example for now. I'm sorry that I'm speaking so long. Um, uh, where you can see how important it is, uh, even years after you got out of the operation. Um, we call this the so-called Italian traffic. Uh, in the, at the end of 2000 or the end of, beginning of 2001, the Germans, as I'm sure the Americans did as well, uh, intercepted um, a message from uh, the Italian traffic. The Italians, being uh, in the European Union, being a NATO partner, uh, still used those machines, and they had intercepted news from, from, the, uh, from, the, um, from Arab countries that um, a few people were on its way to the United States in order to, to learn flying, to go to a flying school. And it expresses where it said, they don't have to start to land and to start. The only thing they have to do to know how to fly straight forward. And that was a few months before this terrible incident, uh, terror attack on 9-11. The sad thing about it is, this was on the table of the analysts at BND, uh, and somebody just disappeared in the weekend and didn't give it on. So if there would have been 
a better control, a better, better reading of this stuff. I, I'm not sure if something could have been prevented. The same uh, I could say about why didn't the Italians do anything, why didn't do the Americans anything. But uh, I'm just telling that story to, to, to demonstrate to you um, how valuable those machines are even after a long period of time. And um, uh, I know that uh, um, probably uh, those old machines are running out now, but uh, I think it's a an, it's an very, uh, very important operation. And uh, Paul, I would like to come once, one more time back to you. I didn't, couldn't see you at the beginning. Um, everybody in that business knows about Enigma. Um, did you show your Enigma machines already to the audience? Or did, I couldn't see that on the... On the, on the, uh, on the yes, list. I did. Yes, oh, you, you, you did it already. Okay, then yeah. the, the, this has been done. Um, well, I'm sure that there might be some questions, and I probably could go on talking and talking about that. But uh, I think it's nearly 55 minutes we talk now. Maybe it's uh, time for, or Paul, Paul and Mark, do you want to add anything to it? Um, no, I don't think I have a lot to add. Um, the only thing that I might want to add is about the history of, um, of, of Operation um, a Rubicon, the Minerva paper, uh, it is very usual for the CIA to write down the history of their operations. They always do that after an operation has ended. But since this operation lasted for more than 30 years, they thought it was wise to do it some way halfway through the operation, which is very unusual because you don't write normally about an operation that's still ongoing. And yet they did this, but what is important to notice, I think, is that it is not written by the official CIA historian because they could not even inform him. Uh, they appointed two people, former um, officers, former security officers, who wrote this paper. So that, in that respect, it is very, very unique. Thank you. Okay. Um, yes. Thank you very much. You. Then shall we pass to the questions then? Yeah, um, I have a few questions myself. Um, sure. If a journalist uh, gets his hand on classified material, he has to deal with some serious questions. For instance, uh, the legal situation, not everybody wants to live for years in a foreign embassy. And uh, giving out information, government secrets, uh, is not necessarily a benefit for society. It can be a dangerous thing, it can manipulate elections, can even trigger a war. Um, so how did you deal with this aspect? Well, that, uh, that was of great concern at the beginning, you see. When uh, I first contacted the colleagues at ZTF, we had a long talk about that, of course, and we involved uh, the lawyers to find out if we are breaking any laws or where could we break laws. Um, as uh, everybody knows, not all those guys in other countries are as smooth with those... Uh, breaking uh, legality on that one. And uh, our lawyer said to us, look, um, it's, uh, we, we are safe on that one. We had certain rules that we don't publish names of people who might still be alive or who are alive because we talked to them, so we didn't do that. Uh, and funny enough, um, of course, we made an official request to BND and to CAA, Greg from the Washington Post uh, asked officially at the CAA, um, and uh, we we didn't get any any proper answer. Man, we 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 got a proper answer. We got a proper answer, like from the BND, from the Chancellery. We got like 14 pages long paperwork uh, explaining us on 14 pages why this was so secret that even in the in Geheimhaltungsausschuss in the, in the Bundestag, those people wouldn't, wouldn't get access to the papers. Uh, but that's it. Nobody said anything to any operation about that. I do not know what happens when I travel the next time to the United States. Um, I have no idea. Um, I think uh, the decision to, to uh, take in other partners, international partners, 
potent partners like the Washington Post, the Swiss, um, the Swiss friends and the Dutch, makes it more difficult for intelligence agencies to go after a single journalist. So um, in this way, we kind of felt safe at the end. At the beginning, it was a big concern to us. We had a lot of talks about it, how to deal with it, yes. The Minerva document was intended never to see the light. Um, how did the agencies react when they learned that you have your hands on this? Well, I, I, I don't know from the BND. I just had an informal talk with somebody who is close to them. And I said, uh, would you like to talk to me about uh, uh, Operation Rubicon? And he started laughing. He said, you know them know that I can't talk about it. So that was it. I know from the American colleagues that uh, the CIA apparently um, was furious when it came out. And they, it took them a week trying to find a leak in the history department where it came from. And they, I don't know if they found out, I have no idea, but uh, they, were not, they, they were not happy about it. Um, but such is life, you see, so. Okay. When the story went out, there appeared a strange conspiracy theory that the material was a limited hangout by the BND, played by some dude called Uwe Müller, not Peter F. Müller, Uwe Müller. And it was uh, given to ZDF just uh, in a controlled way. Is this true? Well, that's, let's put it that way in very f uh, blunt words as bullshit. Okay. I don't know this Uwe Müller. I know I he heard about him that he was mm. dealing with information, whatever. I don't know him. Um, I know where the paper comes from. And uh, the fact is that there was, in, in Switzerland, um, it was. Uh, Uh, reported that this was in, intentionally done now in order to harm the Swiss, the Swiss government and all that. And the, the, the head of the uh, investigation group in the, in the uh, Swiss parliament, Hen, uh, in his uh, press conference called the journalists the bad guys and he called us traitors. We should have never published those, those papers. This, this, uh, we, uh, we are terrible, whatever. No, it's not true. Um, I had those papers for quite some time. Uh, that was not uh, coming just uh, shortly before and now publish it now. But I had it for quite some time and there was an agreement uh, that I had to wait for a couple of years before I would be allowed to publish it. And that happened. So it was not a story which came out now to be planted now. Nobody knew that we were doing it now. We had it already for a couple of years. I could uh, listen to you for hours, yes. but now uh, I think we have to switch to the Q&A session. Um, yes, we do have um, one question so far. Um, sorry for the technical inconvenience and the delay. Um, again, for everybody, if you have questions to ask, please uh, post them on Twitter or Mastodon with the hashtag RC3RS, that's together, or uh, visit us at hackend. Uh, Under the hashtag, uh, uh, under the channel RC3-RS, um, our signal engineers are happy to receive the questions. So we have uh, two. Um, the first is: Is there any date when this paper, uh, when this paper uh, or these papers uh, will be officially declassified? It's a little annoying that we still have to rely on secondary sources with no proof. I well, think it's, yeah. um, frankly, I doubt it that those papers will ever officially be, oh, not, not, not will ever, maybe in 20 years or whatever, I have no idea. But I don't see any, any reason why they should now publish those papers for same reasons that I talked earlier about uh, confidentiality of names, people involved and so on. So um, we got many requests from journalists and we were really... Uh, attacked heavily by, by some people not giving out the paper to the public. And I tried to explain uh, the reasons earlier. Um, first mm -hmm. of all, of course, it's for journalists, it's valuable stuff. There's so many little stories still in that they would, we would like to evaluate and maybe work on for an upcoming book. 
uh, but I do not see the uh, intelligence services, the BND or the CIA, the NSA, publishing those papers in the moment. They have put have nothing gain out of it. Maybe we should add uh, the documents didn't have a secret stamp. It, it was not classified in any way because everybody knew that this paper will see never light. So, there is, so they, they didn't follow the normal procedures of stamping secret, cosmic top secret, ultra gamma former, and what they code uh, use. Um, okay. Um, well, um, please keep your questions coming. Um, the channels, again, hashtag RC3R3S on Twitter and Mastodon. And, of course, our IRC uh, hash RC3-R3S. Um, okay. Um, I uh, do have one uh, uh, question uh, to you when you got... Uh, uh, when you got the papers in your hands and uh, you, you realized the implications about that, uh, what, what were your first thoughts? Um, I, would, uh, I don't know how I would react in that situation. I cannot, I can, I cannot imagine me being in that situation. It's a, it's, a, it's a strange, but it's a very good feeling, I can tell you, because suddenly you have something in your hands um, where you say, oh, this might be bigger than you thought before. Um, and, uh, but then quickly you start thinking, what does it mean? How careful do we have to be? Whom do we involve? And please allow me one thing. It just came to my mind. I forgot to mention something with all the, the political impact of this uh, whole operation. I forgot to mention, of course, uh, the u human victims, I mean, there have been people dying in this operation. Um, one representative of uh, Crypto IG was bombed in his car in 2002 in Saudi Arabia. Um, um, Hans Bühler, the representative in Iran, was held hostage for nine months because the Iranians um, speculated or uh, 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 were suspicious about the, the, the rigged machines. There were several people from the CIA and the NSA who uh, committed suicide. Um, and last but not least, what you have to see in that operation, uh, Swiss neutrality was uh, a victim as well. Because as we know now, we didn't know it when we had those papers, but in the research we did after we have published that, we, uh, we found out how deeply Switzerland with either the intelligence service or with the politicians were involved in it and even a player in it till today. So um, this is why this story caused a political uproar in Switzerland much bigger than in Germany because uh, still being on Swiss soil, still operating from there, um, this is a big discussion, and I think the aspect of neutrality for the Swiss is a big one, but I think they lost their innocence in that story. Sorry to add that, but I, I think it, it's important that the, you see the, the intelligence services and the company, uh, knowing in what danger the employees were, uh, didn't do anything to protect them, and uh, don't forget, 98% of the people involved in that company and, and crypto AG working there as engineers or whatever, or representatives, sales representatives, did not know that the machines were rigged. So they were sent out into dangerous areas of the world to sell those machines, not knowing what they were really selling. And I think this is something we really have to approach the services that didn't, didn't take care of that. I'm sorry to, for oh. this little excuse. No, it's, it's perfectly fine. And I, I do also think that this implication is a big one. Um, uh, there's also another question from Lennart over on Twitter. Um, has there been any reaction uh, on the side of the German government? Now, as I said, um, the only reaction we got was uh, we sent along a list of questions uh, to uh, the, the chancellery, as the, the chancellery is the, the, the supervising board for the BND. And uh, we got a 15, I don't know, 14, 15 page answer, uh, frankly saying nothing. 
I mean, they just said it's so uh, secret that they wouldn't even inform the uh, Parliamentarische Kontrollgruppe, the, 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 the guys from the parliament who control uh, or are supposed to control the secret services. They wouldn't even inform them in the Geheimschutzstelle, where you normally could go and read secret papers, can't take notes, don't photograph them. They wouldn't even do that. That was the only reaction we had from the, from the government. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, so I think that was that so far. Um, thank you very much uh, both, uh, uh, both places for being here um, and everybody that was involved. And thank you very much for, uh, for doing your journalistic work. And um, I think we're looking forward to see your future uh, releases from those documents. Um, and with that, um, I would uh, go back to the break. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>